Welcome back to the Reach Out podcast. Um, we've been away for a while, obviously, due to this pandemic that's been happening. I feel like everybody's, um, you know, needs a bit of positivity in their life right now. So I've gone and picked out three gurus in well-being on the Out of Man, um, just to to brighten up your lives a little bit. And to if you haven't heard of them before or what they do, then hopefully today you'll find out how they can help you in in your life. And also, it's not it's not you know NHS based or anything like that. So it's it's really more more of a holistic view on uh, mental health and well-being so we've got mike Hewley, we've got phil quirk and we've got ian ianson um, i had to get that one right because i know you buy another name yeah, kirk. <laughs> yeah, <that's the> one. <laughs> so you you we'll start with you then uh, can i call you kirky yeah call yeah. me whatever you want mate so i'll start with you <laughs> start with you kirky so you you are a wim hof instructor and you've started your own business with it now uh, yeah, so um, I'm starting my own business to do with health and well-being, really, uh, called Inner Alchemy. Um, Wim Hof Method being uh, one part of that. Uh, I believe uh, health, uh, from mental health to physical health, um, is, is like a puzzle piece. And if you can get enough of the pieces, uh, like a jigsaw, sorry, but if you can get enough of the, enough of the pieces and get them in place, and then you'll have an overall... Um, an overall lifestyle change and a whole a better view of of health really in mm-hmm. general and of yourself and and yeah I, d- I don't know if you guys have have done the wim hof method with kirky i know i've done it once with you yeah it was the maddest experience yeah it was a breath work yeah, yeah. I, I i honestly felt like halfway through i was away from my body like watching the whole room yeah do it and i was like there was a chime that i kept yeah. hearing i was like but it kept bringing me back yeah, I was like, I, I don't know what's going on here, really, but it felt amazing when I came back round. Yeah, it's a it's a deep deep experience. Um, yeah, that know, definitely is a deep experience. Know know thyself, and uh, the breath work. Um, I know Mike teaches uh, mindfulness. Uh, I think uh, Wim has been, been been talking a lot recently on some podcasts, and basically said like breathing techniques um, can have such a profound effect. Uh, so much so that it's like people who do a lot of mindfulness maybe five to ten years worth of mindfulness and don't get as deep as what these breathing techniques can get you know it's um what wim's created with the wim hof method is is like a a shortcut like a biohack into deep meditation really and uh, he found it in cold water you know through through his own pain and his own struggle and his own journey found it um found the cold uh, healed him stilled the mind and um, and yeah, and that's kind of what I get out of it. And uh, even though I hate the cold, as you well know, oh, man, I hate the cold. Yeah, you, you. <laughs> actually on that, on that. Yeah. So we used to play football together, and Kirky was one of the ones that used to hide it when the winter came. Yeah. So when the dark nights came and the wind and the rain came, no Kirky anywhere. Yeah. Well, I normally would get an injury, but then oh, after, of course, that's what they all say. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> that's the truth. Cold yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'd get injured, and then after, you know, you lose a bit of fitness, and then it's like, do you really want to go out in the, in the cold and all the rain, like you said? And it's like, the motivation wasn't there. Then. And, um, but yeah, my, my diet wasn't good. Yeah. And my health wasn't good. Uh, and then, so I had to make some changes. I was forced to make some changes. And I had to admit to myself that I was wrong about a lot of stuff. And then, and then, like like Yoda would say, I had to relearn what I'd learnt. So, yeah. remaster it. Yeah, I, I like that way. Of it. Yeah, I had to let go of some of the stuff that I, I believed was okay. And actually, you know, if my health suffered, then um, then I have to look and listen to my body because the body is intelligent. This is the height of creation that we've been given in this world, and we are the masters of it. And uh, back then, I didn't have a clue about any of that. You know, I was I was just sick, and my body had given up. Um, and uh, then the mind started to give up as well. And in that process, I then had to say, right, well, okay, you're doing something wrong. Let's try a different way. Uh, I always thought meditation and stuff like that, and even reading, you know, I never used to read. Uh, I always used to think it was just kind of a waste of time and cuckoo or you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, a bit weird. Uh, but then I thought, well, you know, I've got to the depths of where if I don't want to be here anymore. Well, why not try and um, be willing to die for health? And that's the kind of way I looked at it. I was willing to to die, to feel good and to feel happy and for my health. And that's kind of the route I went. And um, that's why I fasted for so many days and learned about fasting. And that's why I climbed mountains with Wim Hof. 
in in the in the minus forty degrees up in Mount Snesca in Poland, not once but twice. And why I went to the the murder capital of the world, or what they say is the murder capital of the world in Honduras, and I had to go to the healing village to to see if um, Dr. Sebi was telling the truth and if and experience it for myself, be willing to experience it for myself, and then make a make a judgment rather than just deny something without actually trying it. And that's that was kind of the mindset that I had. So you, you, you literally used to hide from the cold, yeah. and now you've realised that it is actually a healer. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Nature, nature's a healer, so and, the, funny. And, and the cold is a mirror. The cold is like a mirror of, of panic and fear and, and stress and, and everything else. And, and when we learn how to deal with that, then we can deal with so much more stress and panic and fear, and we can just take back the power of the mind. So yeah, so I used to hate used to hate the cold, and now I, I go into the cold and I teach people how, uh, how to go into the cold and deal with that. Uh, I used to hate veggies. You know, my granddad used to hide hide my ve- vegetables in my mashed potato when I was a kid because I would refuse to eat them. And now I'm a vegetarian or vegan. I don't like the label, but plant based. Uh, so, so yeah, that's um, that's where I'm at. That's that's what I'm saying. It's it's the mindset. We can we can change everything. We just have to be willing to listen to the body, listen to yourself, and know what's best for you and and best for the body and and how it how it feels. And obviously, when when things aren't working then change it up. Like yeah, that's it. Think, that's it. That's, that's uh, yeah, key, yeah. I think, because people don't do that. Yeah, and when, obviously when, when, you, when, when things aren't working and your body's going through pain or you're going through suffering or you're going through through whatever it is you're going through, you need to listen to your body because your body's telling you, it's giving you a warning sign, it's giving you a signal saying, right, listen, you're doing something wrong, yeah. you need to change, or otherwise you can carry on and you can keep going down the same route and uh, you're not, you're not going to find what you're looking for. You know, you can carry on, you can take the tablet that's going to mask the symptom. You're not getting to the root cause of the problem uh, and you just carry on perpetuating in that same circle. And, you know, you, it's it's crazy to think that if you're unwilling to change, that, you know, the, the world's not going to change for you. You know, you've got to change yourself and therefore your life will change, not the other way around. You can't just expect the, everything to change without making changes yourself, making some sacrifices. You know, I, I gave up meat because and, and dairy and starch and sugar and all the rest of it because I knew it was acidic to the body um, and I knew that, um, which was hard, don't get me wrong, you know, I love used to love my steak and chips and, and whatnot, but um, but yeah, I had to give that up because um, I found out that it, it was probably making me ill. So therefore I decided to change, um, cut that out and I had to go through the whole process of healing and, and it took me a long time to do so but yeah was, you're good now yeah I feel feel better than I ever felt good <laughs> so, no, that's, that's which is good, good. And, and that's why I want to promote what I'm promoting this is yeah. you know um, like I, it was never my intention to, to become a Wim Hof method instructor or, or whatnot. I just went to Poland in, in the hope that I could help some other people that were suffering but really found out that that was one of the main pieces of the puzzle that I needed um, for confidence, for for energy, for the mindset, and delving deeper into into myself. Really, um, diet's good combined with the method, um, but when you have more pieces, you get more. You can build. make the puzzle, can't you? You can make the puzzle. That's it. You, so, Phil, you've done it before, haven't you? I've se- I've seen you down on Douglas Prom, jumping in the water. Yep. In this weather. Absolutely. Yeah, I love it. Um. I mean, I, I came to the Wim Hof method because I got burnout about four or five years ago. I was kind of under the perception that you, you couldn't possibly get burnout doing something that you love doing. And, and I was just flogging myself teaching. Um, and because I love teaching so much, it's, it's teaching and coaching are my two biggest passions in life. I just got to one day where I just couldn't get out of bed and I'd, I'd you know, literally fried my nervous system. Um, and then... I kind of fell across Wim Hof. I think I, I think I, I saw him on, on uh, Tony Robbins or something like that. I just you know when you're in a YouTube hole, yeah. um, and I came across him, and then I read all these comments about him. And the thing that interested me the most about Wim was that my job in the RAF when I was in the RAF as an outdoor instructor. So I did a lot of mountaineering, and then I was kind of reading this stuff about you know Wim climbing up um, Everest in his in his shorts. And to me, I was like, well, that's not physically possible. It's not physically possible to do that because I know a lot about cold weather injuries i spent a lot of time in norway a lot of time mountaineering um i know about frostbite i know what what happens when you expose yourself to cold 
Um, and then I started looking into it, and you know, and you know, he had done these things, you know, and had evidence to prove it. Um, we're a bit like that humans, aren't we? We're very skeptical. We we, we need to be proven. We don't really accept stuff. Uh, I didn't if, believe it, <clears throat> and it, it, it's just phenomenal. And for yeah. me, I mean, it's I think like Ian just said that it's it's part of a puzzle, and you know, a lot of this, all of these different approaches, you know, whether it's what like Mike does, what what Kirky does. You know what I do. They're, they're all really coming at the same truth, which is spherical. It doesn't matter which way or angle you come at it. It's the same thing. It's about how can we be more connected with ourselves and be better in this kind of crazy world that we've created. Um, I think the reason the reason why the cold is such an interesting thing is because my belief is that we're one of the worst addictions to hit our culture is comfort. You know, we are addicted to being comfortable. And we bend and shape nature all around us all the time in our cars, in our in our buildings. Um, and actually, when you expose yourself to nature, when you put yourself out of that comfort, when you when you get to know yourself, as as Ian said, you find that you're actually much more. You have these almost like superpowers. You know, when you go into the cold for the first time, it really does. It's merciless, as women would say. But when you go in and you breathe into it, and you you don't fight against it, you just accept it and relax. And before long, you get this like wonderful feeling where you're like, actually, I'm, I'm absolutely fine in the cold. Um, and I think that many people could really benefit from that, really benefit from having that, an ex- that experience. And on an island like this, where you've got it all around you in like stunning settings, you know, some of the beaches on the Isle of Man are just phenomenal. Why wouldn't you go and put yourself in nature and just see what you can do with your own body? Um, it's we are comfort addicts, I think, and we're addicted to abundance as well. We need more of everything. We're yeah. con- we're consuming everything around yeah. us. Absolutely, and and like you said, there is there's, there's strength in surrender, you know, and that's what the Wim Hof method is more or less about, you know, especially the cold, and even with the breathing, it's it's about surrendering and just letting go, letting go of all the crap, you know. It, it, you know, when you're in the cold, you're not worrying about your mortgage payment or the argument you had with a family member or a relative or, or whatever you've got going on in, li- in your life. You're just present. <coughs> you're in the present moment, and it's just you and in the cold. And not only that, nature has um, the best antioxidants that you're going to get. You know, um, as much as you want to look into food for that as well, nature provides the same. Uh, it gives off an energy, a frequency. Uh, it's Gaia, Mother Earth, and it, and we're connected to that. You know, the, the, the divine spark that creates nature is within us you know and then if you look into numerology and sacred geometry you'll find out that's the case you know and the same way that the um a sunflower has as it's it's cold and outgrows is the same way our cells grow in the body and it's the same way with the earth and when we connect with it it's it's healing you know it, we just have to get out of our mindset that it's that it's bad for us because that's the way we've been conditioned to believe our whole lives oh Wrap up warm, you're going to catch your death of cold. You know, uh, you know, don't go into the sea. And people think you're crazy of going into nature. And it's like... It, I've got a funny story about that, actually. So where, where, I, where I live in, uh, in England, in Shropshire, don't have the sea there, but um, little, I live just outside a place called Ironbridge. And not last winter, the winter before, I go down and I swim in the river. Yeah. Um, and, and someone had walked past Ironbridge as a bit of a tourist attraction and, and thought that I was <laughs> committing myself to the river. <laughs> oh, no. And instead of like shouting down to me and saying, are you, are you okay down there? Because I was just kind of swimming around. They rang the police. And the next minute, I had two police cars <laughs> and Matt and Rescue turn up no. as I'm getting toweled off and getting dry. <laughs> um, and having to explain to them that I was deliberately going into the river. And they all thought I was crazy. Yeah. They all thought I was absolutely barking mad. But mm. thankfully, you know, with social media and with youtube and with the spread of what wim's you know teaching it's becoming so much more widespread and obviously ian's brought that to the other man you know he's brought yeah. you know when i first started this nobody had heard of wim really i was kind of like this weirdo that went swimming in the sea and um, but now it's 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 spreading and the reason it's spreading is because it works yeah. it's free you don't need any medication you can you can do it and it, it does and you know, there's no, there's no panacea that solves everything. There's no magic pill that can solve everyone's challenges and problems in life. But for me, I always say, well, why wouldn't you do something that's free, that's yeah. non-intrusive, that that is good for most of the, if not every system of your body? Um, yeah. But 
it's, See, it's free and it's powerful it's you know and it, within three days i've seen it so many times now you know of people going into the cold within three to <coughs> three days of different people yeah you know they, you're breaking down these barriers that are within yourself and and that's why Wim does the mini class that you can, you've got he's you know he's got the, the app that's free that you can get can download and you can start and then the mini class is on there you know and he just wants but he's a missionary for people to become healthy happy and strong and it's more or less my mission as well but i was going through the diet uh, yeah. part of it whereas he's added in for me what i've got from Wim is adding in obviously the cold and the mindset and the breathing and, and the commitment as well which is you know if you commit to doing this you become more resilient more resilient and not just to the cold but to everything and then with things like phil are teaching <coughs> with what mike's teaching as well you you're creating more pieces of the puzzle to become a better version of yourself you know and that's that's kind of what we all want there's a couple of points so phil you were saying earlier um we've almost become greedy as like mankind because we can you know we've we've got everything that we want and we can have it whenever we want it do you think that's why people search for the tablet because they feel like that well it's, it's got to be out there because everything else is out there yeah yeah i think you know we like things don't we humans we're, we're like magpies shiny new things and yeah. i think you know social media has exploded that you know we live in i've got i've got a theory there's not no real sort of science to back it up and i've never and you know i'm as I always say, I'm not a psychologist or psychotherapist. I'm a coach, but I think a lot of a lot of depression has its origins in comparison, um, and we spend a lot of time comparing. And you know, when you look at like social media now and what young people experience with social media via comparison, we're kind of we're projecting this kind of weird dystopian perfect life that is not real. But then, obviously, when you look at it through the window of a social media account, can appear real. Um, and I think this kind of consumerism, this comparison, this comfort, um, we, we are fundamentally um, weaking, we're becoming weaker as a species. Um, and I think that shows in the resilience of most people in the Western world these days that, that they, they, you know, the thing that the world needs now is, is resilience. And the only way you can get resilience, in my experience, is to embrace adversity. You know, you can't absolutely as a, as a species we always want the noun without doing the verb so we want to be rich but we we don't want to do the the, the doing work. to get yeah. there we want to be successful but we don't want to do the doing we're always trying to fast forward to the noun at the end of it and if resilience is the noun then then adversity is the verb that gets there that's the path that leads it um and there's no better place to find adversity than nature nature will give you all the adversity you could ever <coughs> hope for I heard once that the cold is like the biggest stress that your body will feel at one time. Being in, being in, a, being so being in the sea, that's yeah. like a, that's one of the biggest stresses a body can feel. So if you can build resilience around that, then everything else that's super stressful in your life, yeah, the, you can build resilience yeah. around that as well. The cold's a trigger. You know, yeah. the cold is, is stress. Nobody wants to go into the cold. It's, you know, every time you go into the cold, there's that little mindset saying, oh, don't do it, or trying to come up with an excuse, or fear, That's doubt. That's me written all over. Yeah, well, there you go. You always so, come yeah. up with an excuse. That's it. Or, or uh, fear, or like doubt, or, you know, not believing in yourself. And, and it's uh, and every time you say, tell this, that mind, that's that little voice in your head that's telling you not to do it, that ego mind. So every time you you can say, no, sh you can shut up, I'm going in. And you've already got it in your mindset, well, I'm here now, I'm going in. I'm giving up, I'm surrendering, you know, like I said, surrendering, just let go and just enjoy it. And be, before you know it, it starts to become addictive, it becomes like a drug because yeah. you you know how good you feel afterwards and you know you've achieved something and you've conquered that that fear, that doubt, that mindset that tells you you're not good enough or you can't do this and you can't do that. And, and when you do that, you know, that's where you connect really with your true self, your true, you know, um, a lot of the time, like we were saying there, Phil was saying about social media, a lot of the time we're, we're so focused on the external world and what we look like and what we perceive ourselves as being and, and uh, comparing ourselves, comparison with other people. We forget that like, the external world is created from the internal world. We forget to go inside and, and look at ourselves, you know, and, and, and study ourselves, you know what I mean? And, and that's kind of where you're going to find peace. Uh, you're going to find peace in the cold, but you're going to connect with that peace on a deep level. Um, inside yourself and, and that's what we need to go back to you know if you can change yourself you can change the world because you know I believe in the law of attraction uh, manifestation and all the rest of the stuff uh, the secret and, and, and whatnot that yeah, I read really good. years ago 
and um, and it works and it does work and the mindset is is part of that you know and and the more we can cleanse the body clear the mind and free it from all the crap that's in it uh, uh, we can therefore live a, a more happier positive uh, life um, in general really. I have a question actually for Mike. So I think Mike's meditating over there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm not <yeah>. sure. <laughs> you know, uh, wise people have something to say, and everyone else says. Something I love that. I love that. <laughs> so, yeah. it's so true. Yeah. I could just, see, I could just see him taking it all in, yeah. and there's something good coming in a minute. Yeah. We. So 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 Ian mentioned addiction, and you you get you do get you do absolutely get addicted to to going into the cold water and. Um, and that, you know, addiction is, you know, is, as most people know, is, I think as much about brain chemistry as it is chemical hooks. You know, there's no there's no chemicals in gambling, but people get addicted to gambling. There's no chemicals in in a, in a mobile phone, but it's the what it does to your brain. Do you think Do you think people get that same kind of addiction once they 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 find that meditate that sort of mindfulness meditative state that perhaps they never experienced, and then once they've had that state, once they've been really deep inside themselves. They then just kind of get really moorish with it, and 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 have, I suppose, a very very good addiction, like like what Ian mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to practicality, but um, <clears throat> I think every single positive experience or even insight, you know, suddenly you understand something about yourself or the world that you never knew before, or you experience something within that you've never experienced before, whether it's cold or meditation or a good diet as positive and uplifting as it is the flip side is it can also be a trap you know you can get stuck there okay. and so you can kind of um so I, yeah so for instance with meditation you know a lot of what i do is introduce people to an experience of themselves without the mind which is the same experience you're talking about as you go into cold yeah. Um, so just something as simple as you know shifting your attention away from the thoughts and into breath, for instance, it could be anything. Mm. Just by taking that spotlight off the thoughts, uh, the mind will just naturally settle and decrease and calm. And often, even in the first you know first ten minutes of a practice with people, they'll experience what's known in Zen Buddhism. They call it no mind, mm. which means you just have an experience where your mind isn't there, meaning thoughts, there's no chat, it's, there's an absence, and it's still. So you're experiencing yourself without the mind, which actually shows you that you're not the mind, because it's not there. So then, you know, you could go into then, well, what am I if I'm not the mind? Well, that's, maybe we can go there, you know, in this conversation. But, but what can happen also is, and this happened to me, um, basically I would say that when you're, you're calm, the mind settles, you're not triggering yourself because it's the mind that triggers you, you know, um, it's the mind that's telling you a negative story and then making you feel anxious. So you, you, you're able to shift gear into this very physically still, neutral, mentally quiet state, which is like, it's peace. And it's amazing that no matter what's going on in your life, if you know that you can shift into that, that will change everything. So it's really freeing, but the flip side is it's it's a form of depersonalization. And not often you hear that in a negative sense, like a depersonalization disorder. Mm -hmm. I think it's a whole spectrum. Um I'm not sure what the opposite is, but maybe it's over personalization, which is where most of us live. Yep. Where we're frantically obsessed with me and mm -hmm. you, as you say, how I look, how I feel, how I compare yeah. myself. Yeah. So you're oh you take everything personally as well. So that, that's kind of, oh, you're over-personalized, relax, take a break, let go, step back, you know, you don't have to do everything. So we can shift into a kind of depersonalized state where it, it basically feels like you're not there. And that is incredibly freeing, but I think you can really hang out there and everything just bounces off you, which again is a kind of strength. But in, in Buddhism, they call this becoming a stone Buddha. Okay. It's like a statue. Yep. Fine, you can sit still and be quiet, but you're not really doing any, you know, you're not able to, to help and there's no activity, there's no engagement. You're just a stone Buddha. Um, so the idea is to not be a stone Buddha, although that's a very common trap, yep. but, but to re-engage, you know, re-engage. And that's where it's more about the kind of the heart 
and you know compassion and in engagement so and that kind of brings you back to life again um but you're coming at life from a different a different place yeah. but so yeah i mean practically speaking i think i think it's what you're suggesting is that you know there's things in life that help us and there's things in life that limit us and the best we can do is wind down the stuff that limits us and um use the useful and even if that's addictive like i love dropping down into that that still state i, I mean i can't imagine living without doing that and i remember when i before i discovered that and my life was hell and it was over personalized and i was just getting I was at war with life, I was at war with my mind, you know, I could never perceive existing without struggle. Mm -hmm. And now that's completely changed. So I don't know if addictive is the right word because it has that negative yeah. sense yeah, yeah, to yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, but it's the same as we, 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 when you're talking about personalization, we do that with language, don't we? We make objective words subjective. You know, if, if I said, I, I'm going to manipulate you, you would have a negative connotation more than likely, but that's what a physiotherapist does with an injury. They manipulate the injury to yeah, help yeah. you get over it. So we, we, we have a, whenever, whenever we use words, whenever we experience words and whenever we hear words, we add our own subjectivity to that. And words can be very, you know, misleading. You can say one thing and it mean two different things. If I said, you know, biting dogs can be dangerous, you know, that could mean two completely opposing things depending on, <laughs> how you listen to what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and I think that words in and of themselves are just words. Yeah. We add we add meaning to stuff. That's what humans do. We add meaning to words. And it depends on it depends on your experience. You know, all the experiences you've had shapes the meaning you add to any word. Um, it, interestingly, because I was kind of thinking when you were talking there, Mike, so obviously Descartes famous, cogito ergo sun, so I think, therefore I am. And what you're talking about is, I if 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 that's true, I think therefore I am, which is obviously the philosophical explanation of consciousness, yeah. is the opposite of that. I don't think, therefore I am not. Um, yeah, or I am, therefore I think. The the amness comes first. The being is what the mind arises in, but the fact that you can experience yourself without mind, without activity, proves that you're you're not the mind. Yes, you have a mind, and yes, it's it's active and there's thoughts but they're just not the same as you you know they come and go and you don't do, do you think part of that is the fact that we kind of live in this in this new part of the brain we've kind of built this world of complexity with this 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 new addition that's kind of only come around depending on which books you read the last you know hundred thousand years this evolution of us being able to develop language and then collaborate in huge numbers and then and then civilizations and then buildings and we've we've lost touch with I think the older parts of the brain, yeah. we, we almost, we spend our life in consciousness and we don't really understand that sitting beneath that is a huge portion of the brain which is still ours, it still belongs to us and is still driving a lot of our health and a lot of our illness, a lot of our behaviour, a lot of the good things that happen and the bad things are kind of driven outside of our conscious awareness but we live in this conscious brain and we try to solve all of our problems with conscious thinking um, and sometimes you can't outthink yourself out of a emotional problem that's deeper down. And I think that's one of the things I've always noticed about hypnosis. It allows people, probably in a very similar way to deep meditation, to, and in a very similar way to the breath work that Ian describes, to sink into that older part of the brain. Um, the, the perception with hypnosis that if I'm hypnotizing someone, that I'm actually doing something to them. But there is no such thing as a hypnotist. There is only self-hypnosis. And the, the analogy that I use is all the hypnotherapist is is like a sat nav. The person is the driver and also the vehicle. And if the sat nav says turn left and turn right, if you follow the sat nav, you arrive in a destination which is in that hypnotic state. But you are not doing any of the driving and you are not doing any of the work. It's the person that's in the other chair. Um, I think stage stage hypnosis has probably tainted the perception of people. Yeah, I think it has quite considerably as well mm -hmm. it's actually very basic as well stage hypnosis is i could teach i could teach someone to do it in an hour and they'd be if they were confident enough they could get up on stage and do it and it's it's very detrimental because it it takes away from the wonderful pure essence of what hypnosis is because it gives it this kind of cabaret circus yeah. I, think it, I think it makes you think is he is he going to make me fall asleep and then 
walk around like a chicken. Do, yeah, yeah. Yes, do that's, when that's, that's absolutely the opposite yeah. of real hypnosis. Yeah, I, and you know, so I, 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 one of the things I never do as a coach, I never do things like diagnosis. Um, I'm a, I'm an absolute advocate of leaving psychiatry to psychotherapists, leaving psychology to psychologists. So, you know, I, I, I don't ever class myself in that bracket. I work with people in that bracket because I think coaching is a spectrum. But for me, hypnosis is one of the most natural states you can ever get in. The first time someone's been hypnotized, it's it's actually not what they think it's going to be. They actually come out of it and go, I, that was not what I was expecting it to be. Because they think they're going to be asleep and they're not going to hear anything. But that's not, not true at all. You You have this paradox where you become super relaxed beyond any sort of comparison but also super alert and aware of all of your senses you hear every every single noise this is why people often say you know when, when i'm taking through a, a mindfulness exercise they say you know if they've done hypnosis previously yeah. they say this is just like hypnosis yes. no because i don't come from a hypnosis background but you know through meeting you and, mm-hmm. and a bit of research i'm aware of this huge overlap yes and i wonder how much overlap there is in the west with what we call hypnosis because we we don't really have a secular mindfulness tradition unless you're in a, you, you, you know, obviously we've got, you know, Western, um, we've got Christianity, so you've got mystical traditions, so you've got, you know, prayer and, and you've got kind of um, meditative um, techniques, but we've kind of lost them because we're a secular culture. Yes. So I wonder if hypnosis is the kind of secular meditation that we've got now, whereas in the East it's still very much you know they know what meditation is i i couldn't agree 100% uh, it, hypnosis meditation when you do the breath work yeah. you it is it is going into this very slight altered state of consciousness where you allow the conscious brain to just get on with whatever it needs to do and it becomes distracted and and then this kind of subconscious brain comes into life now the reason why hypnosis has always struggled with its relationship with medicine you know over the centuries really ever since Franz Anton Mesmer is because of how, how do you prove this thing that's going on inside someone's experience how do you measure it how do you how do you look at what's happening um because you know there, there's no way to really understand what's happening in the person's experience it is their experience and it is just like meditation it is and it's 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 not as I say what people perceive it to be when I do the breath work obviously like what Ian teaches and when I when I meditate, um, I, I'm I'm a terrible meditator, which I'm a bit nervous about sitting next to me. <laughs> the reason why I, I fell in love with the breath work was because the cold removed the need for m- my brain to focus on anything. I suddenly, yeah. I, because I'm in the the cold war, I don't need to be worried about trying to bring my thoughts into the into the presence. The water did it for me, um, and that really yeah. worked. But all three states. Yeah, I find very similar. I was I was going to say that I've never been hypnotized. Obviously, well, I'll, hopefully next week you can do that. Yeah. Um, but I can't. Only you can do that. <laughs> no, but obviously you can help me. <laughs> well, you can help me get we, to that state. Everybody's been hypnotized. Yeah. We're, we're constantly hypnotized. It's not. It's not uh, as we were talking before we came on. It's not a switch like a one or a zero where you you, you switch it on like a light. It's it's analog. We're we're we're, we're in a constant state of hypnosis. Um, there is a lot of theory that actually children, you know, up until the age of like seven or eight, are pretty much constantly hypnotized. That's why their mm. creative thinking just runs away, and they can have this amazing imagination. And then we kind of start schooling them and you yeah. know telling them to you know stop daydreaming, them. which yeah. is the, the daydreaming is the window of hypnosis. Mm. Stop daydreaming and concentrate. When actually daydreaming is this like wonderful creative state. Um, yeah. We're very odd humans in lots of respect. We do. We we do some odd things, don't we? Yeah, I mean, like like you were saying there though about um, about the cold um, and the different parts of the brain. So one thing about the Wim Hof method is we can get deep inside the the, the most ancient brain, the reptilian brain, and the part of the brain that is um, basically the scene in the study. You were saying like the, you know a lot of people they can't show what what's going on in the head, whereas Wim's actually now done the study. He did the Mich- Michigan sc- uh, study, and what they found out when they had Wim under a brain scanner, and they, we had him in a special body suit, and they were filling him with cold water, and um, they had him doing nothing, none of his techniques, none of his, his stuff with his mind and his visualization, just nothing, and he just reacted like a normal person. His, his uh, skin temperature and everything was going up and down, just like all the other normal people. So he would have got frostbite at that point? 
not frostbite. Like it's it... quite difficult to get frostbite. So you know, obviously, it was a controlled study. It was in the, it was in the hospital and whatnot. Uh, he was under the brain scanner. Yeah. And um, and then what they found when Wim started using his 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 mind and his techniques, he was actually generate started to generate heat. Um, not ah. only that, he was actually accessing instead of twenty five percent of the brain, he was accessing one hundred percent of the brain. The whole brain was lighting up. He was no also way. getting deep into the periaqueductal grey hemisphere of the brain, which is located in the in the deep part of the the brainstem. And uh, through that, he was releasing his own opioids, which we know we've got an opioid uh, problem going yeah. on in the world right now. So this is naturally in the body. He was releasing his own um, his own opioids, which is pain management. Uh, and also cannabinoids, uh, so you'd like your CBD. So naturally, in the brain we have our own cannabidiol, which is you know CBD, which is a derivative, a which is a chemical from can- cannabis. Which you know I know there's a lot of stuff going on about the rallies and stuff like that at the minute with legalization of that. But this is what we all have naturally within our body already, and you know it's just accessing that. It's just that's blown my mind. Yeah, it's just that's, and you've just reminded me as well. Um, people. Uh, and how mindfulness just relates to what you're saying um people tend to think you know so if you if you go into the cold you know yeah you're completely uh, awake there's no chance of yeah. avoiding that alert know, alert no um people sometimes think with mindfulness it, it, this we have this western interpretation of mindfulness you know my my and i do teach that but my background is more with with its roots you know don't we have to sit with you with your hands in the air and cross well that's what we think like that yeah and and we also think uh, that it is relaxing and so sometimes when i go into a studio of people have you know set it up for me the lights will be low and (laughs) and i whack them up because i don't want people to fall asleep i mean you can do that for free this is something different and actually um what we know is that when people practice mindfulness techniques it doesn't calm any part of your system down it doesn't calm your brain down it actually wakes it up and just as you were saying in the most advanced meditators uh, their brain is being completely fired up the whole brain is is lit up and that's uncommon yeah yeah but what it shows is and, and with win by being more conscious and more aware your brain lights up and you get a much heightened experience of of everything everything yeah. is more um uh, uh alive and alert in ways that you know one one teacher i like gurdjieff um he used to say man is asleep mm-hmm. and that's what he means most of us are walking with our eyes closed we're, we're basically sleepwalking through our lives and if you think about the brain, Absolutely. as you're saying, lighting up using its full potential for healing, for growth, for insight, um, that's what we mean by awake yeah. or awakening in yeah, a kind yeah. of spiritual sense. Yeah. But we've lost, you know, our culture, uh, you know, we've lost all our techniques and we've lost our connection with nature. Yeah. We, we've we kind of lost it. I mean, I think we're being forced to rediscover it now, yeah. um, which is a good thing. But we all have it within us. It's, you know, we are nature. It's yeah. here on the yeah. chair right now. Yeah. If you're listening to this, it's within you. But we're told, you know, again, yeah. to look outside and the mind is only looking outside. If the mind stops to look inside, that's pretty much the end of the mind. You know, the mind keeps going by looking, having the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. If you turn the mind back on itself to look at, you know, what's its root? Where's the mind coming from? Um, that's pretty much the end of you being the mind. Um, wow. it's time to remember who we who we actually are yeah. you know and what we really are is energy you know and we come from, all come from the same source of energy and and um, we can connect with that that inner connection that divine spark of creation is there within us it's, it's this is not some voodoo little thing you know like Wim says and then that main source of energy is, is love it's literally love it's a frequency it's something you can resonate with and connect with and and, and be on and it's not it's just this hippie well just thing connected that to that about. yeah i mean we were just talking about zahir before you know mm, zahir yeah. khan and um so i've just thought as you're saying that um because it can sound like now we've gone off track and we're talking about stuff that is is you <laughs> this know, can go wherever it is up in the air <laughs> yeah but so one of the speakers we've had for the last two years at mindful man is steve taylor yeah. who's an author um, psychologist um transpersonal psychologist so he studies people who have what's known as awakening experiences or shifts in consciousness 
which you might think is either, you know, make-believe or extremely rare. Like, you'd need to be meditating in a Himalayan cave for 10 years in order to have some kind of fundamental shift. No, it's completely common. You, we all probably know people who have had such a shift. Not everybody's talking about it. They may, they may keep that, you know, private because you start talking about it out loud and there may be a real danger that you are section depending on who you're talking to so you have to be careful you have to be in the right company to share oh i was one with the universe or something like that yeah for sure but it happens and it happens much much more than we think it happens and so when steve came here to do a talk i introduced him and i said just before we start i'm interested just put your hand up if you've ever had a moment of insight or an awakening awakening experience that was non-ordinary where you realized something much bigger than yourself was happening or way beyond your understanding basically the whole room put their hand up so this is common this is a very common thing we're talking about and i i, I my guess is it's getting more common it's a bit it's a bit like telepathy isn't it most people have had an experience of telepathy and the most common is the two most common forms of telepathy is what's called phone telepathy you think about someone ringing you your phone rings oh, and you go oh my yes. god i was just thinking about that person we pass it off as chance yeah. because we can't explain it and the other one is a, a gaze telepathy you know you yeah. know that we've got our five fundamental senses and you know our visual sense you know expands out to the front um and someone's staring at you from behind and then you turn around because you feel as though someone's staring at you. Mm. How does that connection happen? Because well, your visual is. sense has been going that direction. Many people have this experience. Um, uh, but I think that we pass it off, don't we? Mm. we you know, you, you kind of look at the phone and you go, well, it's just a coincidence. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's... it's, it's well, Jung would say it's synchronicity, yes. you know, synchronicity, which is a yes, whole different yeah. thing. Yeah, which you think, oh, that's just... Yeah. The three road buses. You'll see them all. You'll yeah. see them all at once. You'll see one bus, and you'll see three. Yeah. That's what people say, isn't it? You'll see one bus, and then three will come along. Well, you buy a certain car, and then all of a sudden, you you see you, you see, see it everywhere. everywhere, and it's like, but oh, this is what I learned from you, Phil. Yeah, yeah. exactly. There's a part that. of your brain that's responsible for that, though, isn't it? You you raz, which yeah. is which is interesting with the world we're living in now, because a lot of the presentations I've been given, been giving sorry lately, is is one of them is called the Happy Chappy Guide. And what 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 I did is I I I, I wrote the presentation out of anger because. When we went into lockdown in the UK, my my fiance has leukemia. She's had it for like five or six years now. So medicated, so it's all controlled. But obviously, she's in a high risk bracket. And the letters that we were getting from the NHS, which were you know there, I would think to make her aware of the dangers and the risks, had this really negative impact where she became reclusive. Like she came yeah. from this really bubbly person. It's like super outgoing to suddenly she wouldn't go out the house. I had to go to the shops. When I came back, I had to take all my clothes off, put them straight in the washing machine. And I started to look at this. And I was like, well, we're surrounded by this news coming into our brain. We're getting these letters from the NHS. Fear. There is fear literally viscerally everywhere around us. And, and what's happening in front of my eyes, you know, knowing what I know about how the brain works and my interpretation of it, her RAS, which is like her Google search engine in her brain, is her browser history is now coming fuller and fuller and fuller with all of this really negative stuff. And then, you know, coronavirus or COVID or the fear of it suddenly becomes, you know, the you know the red buses. Mm -hmm. her, her her brain is acutely aware, and whenever there's something that confirms that, it pays attention to it and it adds to that browser history. Um, so the whole point that I wrote the Happy Chappy Guide was because I was, I was actually getting angry with the way it was affecting Ruth. I was like, yeah. you know, we need to talk about this. And thankfully now a much better place. And But there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of people that I've coached through, you know, this pandemic um, off the island and on the island um, that are really struggling. And the reason why they're struggling is all the things that give them good brain chemistry, the stuff that they love doing, the connection with other humans, the vitamin D that gives us our serotonin, the, you know, all of the stuff that we need to be have happy, healthy mind, we strip it out when we go into lockdown. And my anger with the with people of responsibility, like the governments, we should be communicating with people. Yes, this is the danger. Okay, we can talk about this. We can have these aggressive zoomed in pictures that personifies coronavirus. But at the same time, these are the things that you can do that will really help you. You know, these are the things that will maintain that mindset, even in the adversity that we find ourselves. We're not give, we're not we're not communicating that message. And if we are, I'm, we're not communicating it effectively, in my opinion. But then, 
you know, if we communicated that message, and this is what we're talking about, yeah. the downside is I actually have to do something. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And as you say, we're addicted to comfort. We have this cultural mindset. And we're used to, as you say, well, everything you, you said, you know, I'm just repeating, you know, we, we, we're in this abundant culture where I'll do anything, but just don't don't make me do something. Yeah. 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 You know, just give it to me. You know, I'll do what you say, but don't make me think for myself. Don't yeah. make me observe my own behavior. Don't make me kind of step out and take a, a more global perspective because, you know, that's too much hard work. I, I can give you a great example of this. Actually. <laughs> my, my Achilles heel in coaching is um, smoking cessation for some reason. I'm, and, and I came to this realization um, that, that a lot of people that really want to give up smoking will do anything except for giving up smoking. <laughs> They're prepared to sacrifice everything except for giving up smoking. And it's, it's kind of this theory that often we want change, but we don't want to change. We want things to be different, but we don't want to change anything for that to be different. And there, I think there is a huge part of that personal responsibility. You know, your mind is your mind and, um, and you've got to be proactive and do good habits Often the thing that we do as a culture, as a sweeping generalization, the things that we do in adversity compound our problems with our mind. We drink more. We, we, we tend to eat a worse diet when we're under a lot of stress. We sleep less. Um, we drink more coffee to compensate. We stop doing the activities that we gives us our, you know, our dopamine and our oxytocin because we're busy and we're stressed out and we haven't got time. So the, the very habitual behaviors that we start to engage in actually start to work against us when we need the most um and at some point we are, we've got to collectively and individually then say i've got to take responsibility um going in the cold is a great example yeah. i get really busy and then I, I haven't done it for like three months and then i go I, go, I haven't done that for ages i'm going to go and get and have a swim in the and i go and do it and i feel unbelievably great and like i think to reset. myself why haven't yeah. i been doing that for three yeah. months yeah because i've been I've been busy, you know, everyone has the badge called busy, don't they? Yeah. Well, this this is this is exactly why when you suggested doing this, Mike, obviously this was, we were in Noah's and, and we suggested doing a podcast together. This I found this was the perfect time to do it because everyone's, you know, we've come out of lockdown, we're trying to get our lives back in, in check, but I feel like a lot of people now realise what mental health is and what they can do or what's out there um, for their well-being other than, you know, your NHS or your tablets, that kind of thing. People are now willing to explore what can really help them in life now, I think. And I think this is a perfect time because, you know, if we would have told them before lockdown, why don't you take a cold shower throughout, throughout the day? Yeah. You know, do some breathing. Yeah. Why, don't you, why don't you meditate? Why don't you give gratitude? Yeah. This is what all three of you teach yeah. people. That's it. And if we would have said that, you know, during lockdown, I think we could have... Like you say, Phil, if they would have sent Ruth... Um, you know, letters saying, here's things that you can do to really keep your your positivity through this pandemic that we're going through. Yes. Well, like, uh, we, it would have been so different. Yeah, yeah well, well, that's it. I mean, I think through dest destruction breeds creation. Yeah. Uh, I think right now a lot of people are going through um, hard times and it's making them realise and search for other things. And that's why I set up Inner Alchemy. It's like uh, the motto of it is uh, a seeker becomes a finder because if you're willing to look and rather than just go with the mainstream narrative i mean yeah. um you you will find what you, what you want and you'll find it from within yourself um the government tells you you need to wear a mask where where we know the science says that breathing techniques can influence the autonomic nervous system the innate immune system uh, so that doesn't make sense we know that going outside and going into nature gives you the best antioxidants that you can get and it's going to you know and especially going into the cold is going to make you feel great government tells you to stay in your house you know what I mean? And isolated from your family and loved ones. Uh, they want you to anti-social distance from, from people. Um, where we know that hugging relatives and family members and being around other people releases oxytocin, the love chemical, the feel-good hormones, which is going to make you feel good. And and then they promote all this negativity and all this fear. Yeah. Um, so I think this is a great time now of change and a great awakening. And I know uh, Mike mentioned is it Steve Taylor, yes, uh, mindful man. And he was because I was working that day myself. Uh, he was one of the only speeches I got to see, and um, he was talking about you know when people get to the depths of their own self, they, they have these these experiences, and that is kind of what um, put me on this journey uh, through my darkest times um, when I got to the point where I didn't want to be here anymore. Mm. Uh, it was um, I started looking and I started to read um, The Power of the Subconscious Mind by Dr. Joseph Murphy 
uh, which was amazing. I started to meditate. Things on I was seeing things on the television like Wim Hof. Uh, watched another guy um, called Ricks and Gracie uh, with a documentary called Choke, who's a, a jiu-jitsu guy. And I started doing some breathing techniques. And during that moment of doing these breathing techniques, and I didn't even realize what I was doing, um, I had kind of an out-of-body experience that changed my whole perception of reality. And then after that, you know, it was, like you said, some people might start to get sectioned uh, and whatnot, and you're talking about connecting with the universe, and that was literally kind of what happened to me. But um, what, you, what you're saying is you, you went seeking, and you found like yeah, what you were looking basically, for, which, basically, which um, also works what, with what, what you say, Phil, about the rise. Yeah, like he's he's then he's then gotten his eyes a lot more positive stuff, and he's yes. seeking. Yeah. And so then you Google search engines and looking for positive so, rather so, than negative. So think of your um your subconscious brain. So think your stomach consumes nutrients, doesn't it? So so when you eat, you experience the flavor of the food through your mouth, but you don't experience anything once it goes down to your stomach. You might feel full, but you don't actually you're not have you don't have any awareness of it. But it's being consumed, and all the nutrients are being spread around the body. Your subconscious mind does that with information. Yeah. So information that comes into your brain. That's a very it, good it, analogy, it, by the way. Yeah. So your subconscious is a, a consumer of everything that's going on around you. So as you know, as Bruce Lipton talks about, you know, when when you're a biologist and you have a problem with your cells in your petri dish, you know, the first thing you look at is the environment. Because mm-hmm. ninety nine times out of a hundred, it's the environment that's the problem with the cells. Mm-hmm. And if we're kind of like a a community of sort of 400 trillion cells, you know, thinking about the environment that we put ourselves, thinking about the information that we're absorbing into our subconscious, it still sits in there and it starts to fill up the RAS, it starts to fill up your subconscious mind. You might not even be aware of it. It's how marketing works. You know, we yeah. think we make these free decisions that we want to go and buy something, go and see a, a show, but really we've, yeah. we've been marketed, you know, for however long. And that's because the subconscious brain is on constant consumer of everything that is in your experience subliminal all around you subliminal. you know what that, that you know what what is around you is what you're taking in without you even re- even knowing it you know uh, it's like going into the cold the hypothalamus uh, in the brain will check out the temperature it's doing it right here now it's telling you what temperature the room is and what temperature your body needs to be it's automatic it's automatically scanning the room and doing that you know and and this is we need to we need to go back to looking at our, ourselves, you know, and then we realize, um, like you know me from from the past, yeah. and you know I'm not the same person I was back then. I'm I'm completely different. In fact, I'm not the same person I was a minute ago because I've already learned something new. I'm already adapting. Like some of the stuff Phil and Mike have been talking about here, stuff that I've kind of delved into but don't really know as much about. So therefore, you've adapted already. And you're a different person, you know. So, am, am I right in thinking that I, I, I once I saw it an amazing TED Talk once and the, the guy in the TED Talk said the, the, the oldest cell in your body is seven years old apparently yeah. which is the no some way. cells in your spine so yeah. every the, the, the hunchy that sits here now and the mic and the fill yeah, and the yeah. kirky that sits here now seven years ago none of these cells existed um, no way yeah. so so every cell you know you obviously you, your taste buds are rejuvenated hair grows nails grows but every single cell is 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 given birth and it grows and it dies and then it's yeah. replaced and regenerated um, and I, 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 I'm not entirely sure on the accuracy, but I presume it was because he was a very, very renowned scientist that was talking about it. Seven years, the oldest cell. Yeah. So an argument that you had 10 years ago, technically, you, you weren't there. Yeah. You weren't there. So yeah. if you're still holding on to that argument, then, then yeah. no <laughs> this way. is something, um, you know, in mindfulness, we delve into this a lot, where basically everything is a process. There's, there's no, there's nothing that's an actual stuck object that that does not exist, you know, on a quantum level, on any kind yeah. of level. But we, we, as you said, we turn ourselves into a noun. Yeah. I am me. Full stop. What you've just referred to has no existence. Yeah. You know, you say, "I'm my body." How many bodies have you had? Yeah. Five year old, ten year old, last yeah. week. Oh, uh, my thoughts. How many thoughts have you had? Mm. You know, you have like seventy thousand a day. So what what are we actually referring to when we say me? It's this flow. That's what yeah. we are. We're a flow. Nothing gets stuck in that flow. Yeah. Um, which going a bit deeper then goes into this notion of no self, where there's not there's not a concrete thing in you that's doing stuff. Mm. You know, um, there's just this flow, and you're not doing the flow. The flow is happening. Mm. You know, like the tree. The tree's not making itself happen. It's just happening because the universe is happening. Mm. So in the same way, you know, you're sitting on the chair listening, but you're not doing it. It's happening. You know, there's just this flow happening. And that's why when we go into nature, um, 
nature's not telling you anything. Mm. It's not saying, I'm a tree. No, the mind says it's a tree. Yeah. And you're talking about meaning at the start, I think. Yeah. Um, I once gave a talk and I was saying that, you know, I don't, this may sound negative, but I'll explain it. There's no meaning to life. He said, what's the meaning of life? And I said, there isn't one. There's the one you give it. But again, that's the mind coming up with one. Nature doesn't give you a meaning. It just gives you its its isness. Yeah. It just is. Yeah. That's it. That's all it needs to be. Um, and he said, what's the point then? And someone said, you could always enjoy it. But that's the point. You could always just yeah. enjoy the fact that this doesn't need a meaning. It just is. Yeah. Like Wim would say, uh, don't think, feel. And the same Bruce mm. Lee would say, you know, feel. The feeling of oh, women say feelings and under, understanding. Um, Bruce Lee would say, don't think, feel, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it's that flow state, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think I mentioned to this yeah. to you before, Hodge, where, you know, you might be playing football or you're doing something, the body's active, but the mind's still, yeah, and this is why a lot of people like sports, because when they're keeping the body active, the mind can be still, it can be at peace, and uh, you just react it just, you know, whatever you're doing, the muscle memory or whatever, the body just reacts. It's like when you're playing football and you do something and you didn't even think about doing it and you just react and you just turn or you just do something that's just completely, you think is impossible and you, you do it, you know what I mean? And it's just being in that state of flow. And, and that's, and what, that's, that's like life. Yeah, yeah and that's what also, you know, um, points towards this no self. Like just before yeah. we were recording, you, you said uh, out there, you know, sometimes I'm driving and I don't know how I get there. Yeah. Well, who's driving then? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Suddenly you arrive home, but you're not. It's, it's automatic. Yeah, it's just it. this intelligence. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, there's an intelligence that does the driving. Yeah. There's an intelligence that plays football without having to think, where am I going to kick the ball and get it yeah. in? There? It just happens. Yeah. It's this intelligence that we are, but we don't think we're this kind of broad intelligence. We think I'm this scrunched up little me that yeah. has all these troubles and issues. And well, that's not you at all. Yeah. Wow, that's just blown my mind. Yeah. Tell, tell me this though, Mike. <laughs> so, the flow state and stuff like that we were just talking about, and we've definitely had this conversation, me and you, um, F Phil. Yeah. About, I think I asked you, so why is Lionel Messi like so much better at it, at getting into that flow state? If that makes sense. Because obviously you, you watch watch Cristiano Ronaldo, watch Lionel Messi play football, and I'm referring to football because I'm a, I'm a football fan. Yeah. But they do things that just look out completely out of the ordinary. They just look so at home and How comfortable. Much training do they do? That's yeah, 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 yeah. Training. So, so okay. th th this is this is kind of like I think talent has plays a role, and obviously I've worked in sports yeah. a fair amount, and talent has its role. And I think what they have is a a certain amount of genetics and talent that's that's definitely on their side. Um, but what you probably find is I think is it Gary Player, the 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 golfer said the the more I practice, the luckier I get. And yeah. and I think that what you find with people that are at the very very pinnacle of their game, they're the ones that combine talent with absolute relentless commitment and dedication, dedication to their craft. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you do that, if you um, I, I once gave a presentation with, with with Ed Clancy, and someone said, you know, how do you how do you maintain your motivation between you know Olympics? Bearing in mind that everything is built around a four-year cycle for these you know these track cyclists and in the team pursuit it's you know it's only lasts a couple of minutes anyway like four, less than four minutes and you might only ride three or four rounds so you got like 12 or 16 minutes work or 12 or 16 minutes focus work yeah. and then you've got four years surrounding that to make sure that on those 12 or 16 minutes everything goes right and Ed's Ed's answer was really insightful. He said, "I don't. I'm, I'm. I'm. A lot of the time, I'm not motivated. If I, you know, in December, I look out in Yorkshire and it's like bucketing down. The last thing I want to do is get on my bike and go for a long, you know, five hour ride. But, but what we have is commitment. And the way to think about this is, people don't think about not going to work. Do they? Even in, people are not necessarily motivated every morning and get up and go. Do you know what? I've got work today. I'm going to kind of wait. Yes." <laughs> Because motivation is an emotion that comes and it goes, you know, it's like happiness, it's like sadness. But when you have commitment, and what, what he talked about was commitment will always beat motivation. It will yeah. always overtake it because when you're committed to something, when you're dedicated to something, you can be motivated or not motivated. It doesn't matter. You still go and do it. You just do it because you're committed. And I think, I think that's what a lot of people perhaps in, in life, they make the mistake. They rely too much on being motivated to do stuff and not enough on being committed. Um, it, in my experience anyway i'd say yeah i mean mm. that's that's the fundamental main for me the main pillar of the wim half method to these three pillars the breath work the gradual cold exposure and the commitment the mindset commitment and having that commitment to to every day you want to want to get a cold shower or every day you want to um 
make that a part of your life because you're going to feel good even though it's some days you might wake up and you're like, I don't want to go for a swim in the sea or I don't want to uh, get the cold shower. I just want to have the comfort of the warmth or whatever. But if you just go past that and you commit and you, you're going to feel great, you know, and, and commitment is, is the main one, it's especially with, you look at Ronaldo, he's only the best because he he's willing to sacrifice and do more than anybody else. You know, mm-hmm. he put in the hours. The more you put in the hours, the better you're going to be. The more relaxed you're going to be in a stressful environment, the more you're going to be in the state of flow. You're tra- and so they're training themselves to not just be really good at football, which I know nothing about, but, uh, you know, training themselves to be in this flow state all the yeah. time. And yeah. I think it's a um, famous baseball player, Yogi Berra, uh, and I'm paraphrasing him here, but he said something like, I only hit the ball when I'm out of the way. Yeah. yeah. TT race is the same. Yeah. The problems they have is when they start thinking about things. Yeah. You know, if you think about the speed that they're going and everything that's happening around them, they they don't have time to consciously process stuff. Yeah. What they rely... The, the, there's, a, that, there's that phrase in it, adrenaline junkie and I, yeah. I think there's a book by Stephen Coppola called Rise of the Superman which says that it's not it's not adrenaline junkies people get addicted to flow state it's yeah. flow junkies the adrenaline is your you know your flight your freeze flight fight system kicking in telling you not to get on that bike because it absolutely makes no sense yeah. not to do that base jump not to ski down that black run you know it's every fiber of your body going this is dangerous don't do it but then it's the commitment once you go over and you start and your your mind realizes, well, we're in now, we're, yeah. we're, we're racing, we're going down. So there's no point in having this adrenaline to stop you doing it. What we now do is we turn on this amazing flow state. Is it Mihan Chiksa? Mihan, the Hungarian psychologist, started looking at it. And it's when there's no there's no, there's no no future or past. You're not thinking about anything. Yeah. There's no thoughts. There is just what's happening. Um, and I think for athletes, uh, when they get into that zone, that's when they perform at the very top of the game. You speak to any athlete in any sport and you ask them their best ever performance and it'll be in a period where they weren't thinking about anything. It just was happening. That's but th- this is what we try to do in, in mindfulness practice is integrate it. So we can drop into that state You know, when you're sitting on your meditation cushion, which again, you've got to commit to because you don't want to sit when you're afraid or sad or bored or lonely yeah. or your mind is playing some old scenario but you you sit anyway and you you learn how to sit with that stuff and watch it fade away but um but yet ultimately um we're trying to turn each moment into high performance so that even if you're buying you know you're you're shopping from tesco's the apples are you're, you're just intensely aware of apples and the shopping cart and the people around you and so, so your whole life becomes this um, heightened state, not not just yeah. when you're doing something where there's uh, you know a lot of adrenaline required, yeah. but um, can you do it the rest of the time too? Can you make every single moment like when I when you picked me up there? I was yeah. just talking to um, a guy I know who cleans the streets, and yeah. all we talk about is he was just talking about how beautiful the leaves were and how he's really started looking at them. Like really looking at them. So this is you're going into flow state, and you're not an, you're not an Olympic athlete. You're a street cleaner. Yeah, but you're living in this high performance way. Yeah, it's it's that heightened state of awareness. Sorry, yeah. but you know, like when when a TT rider is going onto the bike, you know, he becomes one with the bike because it, there's no thoughts. And not only that, being in that heightened state of awareness, your body is reacting at a lot at a lot faster speed because well, it, it has to be, doesn't it? Yeah, because it has to. Yeah. And and you know, it doesn't like you said, it doesn't have to be about the adrenaline. I found that on the mountain where I was closest, you know, as close as I'm going to be to, to death, maybe, if yeah. you want to look at it that way. But, like, I was completely aware, completely focused, and completely in flow state and completely at peace because there was no thoughts, you know. And, and it wasn't like I had all this adrenaline going because of, of fear or anything like that because surrendered I've surrendered that, you know. I didn't have that fear of dying or death or what. No, it was just complete oneness. It was just complete stillness. And, and that's obviously what they find during those states and obviously through meditation and other things like that is the the state that you can get in and um and in that moment is where you're going to find real peace and real harmony and real healing as well because you're access, accessing a different part of the nervous system and it's it's magic it's I, i've definitely found I, th- I think what you'd call real peace in doing what you you two guys do mm. i know i felt it when i did the, the breathing with you kirky I I felt in like I said I I felt like I was watching over my body, yeah. but the chime went and I came back and just the the peace that I felt when I when I came back round and I and I came out of it, 
I just didn't think anything else was going on in the world. Yeah. I just felt like I was lying there and I, I didn't need to rush a, to do anything. Yeah. I, then, I literally just felt like I was, I don't know, I've never felt it before. Yeah, the yeah. closest I've felt is when I've I've done what Mike does, yeah. meditation. And, and and the more you do that, so the more you go into the cold, or like, like an athlete or anything, or like a, a TT rider who gets onto the bike, the more you do it, the more you create that muscle memory to be able to go back there at will. Mm. You know, and that's kind of right. like what Wim does when he's under the ba- brain scanner and he's he's got all these machines going around and he can't really do his breathing techniques because he can't really move properly, but he used visualisation to take him back to the moments wow. when he was on Everest, when he was in underneath the frozen lake, when he was doing his marathon, he takes himself visually back into that and can then recreate that feeling within the body. And it's like you talked about Bruce Lipton and your environment. So he's visualized and taking himself back into that environment and the body just adapts because of the mind. This, it's, this it's, is what, I think it was what, what me, you taught me at Mike. I think, um, which I do quite often now to sort of when I overthink, because I might do overthink a lot. I think we all do. Well, maybe not you guys because you know how to deal with that now. But I do find myself overthinking and I, I'm pretty sure it was you that told me this. So, hopefully it was um just go you know go out for a walk and just take your headphones out and just listen to to everything around you mm. listen to the furthest thing that you can possibly hear yeah. mm-hmm. and then note it that you've heard it mm. and i i feel so peaceful when i'm doing it because i'm i'm like you say i'm in nature and i'm hearing things like i've never i've never heard before yeah. so my feet on the floor mm. cars the trees like Listening it's such a calm is state. such an obvious and direct way to meditate. Yeah. It doesn't even sound like it's it's a thing just to listen, but but it is just to whether whether you're listening into silence in a room or you're listening into the birds or the trees, just to stop and actually listen. And um, I I would suggest if you're really listening, you'll automatically drop into a no mind state where there's no thoughts. You're just you become the listening, as it were. You know, there's just listening happening. That's it. I'd, I'd honestly suggest to anybody who's who's never done this before, just give it just give it a go because maybe when you seek that tablet that you're not going to find, maybe doing something like this can really change your life. I I, de- I definitely think it can do anyway. I think another good example of that is coffee. You know, and then mm-hmm. bear with me as I connect these two together. Um, it's got to be the devil's drink, um, that, isn't it? Honestly, yeah. I, but, but many many people Stimulant. many people really love coffee. You know, me included. I, I'm I'm so very drinking much, a coffee. Then. I, I I I you know I do, and this is this is kind of like one of the the negative things about doing this type of stuff is that pe- people sort of have this perception that you you don't have any vices. Like when you yeah. when when I get seen drunk and people are like you're drunk and I'm like I always <laughs> get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, because you kind of you know people have they, they have this like false perception mm. that you you know you, you live this kind of angelic lifestyle but we're all human and we have our vices but coffee's a great example many people today really love coffee you know you've got obviously from where we're sat here at Max Radio you've got Noah's down there you've got all the coffee shops around around Douglas coffee's a part, part of our culture now I'd say but ask someone who really likes coffee the last time they really took the time to savor the coffee you know like making it smelling it experiencing it via all the senses you know not thinking about just drinking it because they've got to be somewhere in an hour or got to be somewhere we we live in the we live just ahead of ourselves don't we we live where do i need to be in 50 minutes what appointment have i got later and we forget about the stuff that's happening and this you know we we, we as a generalization and certainly me i you know I enjoy and love a nice cup of coffee, but I don't enjoy it and love it properly, I would say, enough for my liking. I spend a lot of time doing exactly what I've just said there in a rush to get going somewhere else, and I'll drink the coffee and not even have any kind of a awareness of it. But that's what a ritual is. You know, if, if uh, it's such a heavy word, ritual, you think, oh, God, are we doing something with rituals? That's like we're going into deep religion here, which I'm not interested in. A, a, a ritual is something that is slowed down and it's done extremely consciously. And we use that word a lot like, oh, it's my ritual to have a coffee every day. Yeah. But it's not a ritual because you don't taste it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. but you, you could make you could make, you know, the drinking of coffee a ritual. Yeah. So, so you, when if you so it's about ritualizing your life. Yeah. You know, what can you do in your life that becomes an, a conscious moment? And sometimes people say, they say, yeah, what well, once in meditation or once years ago, I had this moment, I had this experience and, you know, I was trying to get it back. And I always remind people that, A, that's gone and it's the nature of experience to come and go. So 
don't go chasing it, it's gone. And the next thing is, that moment is this moment if you just pay attention to it. It's the same, it's right here, but you think you've missed it now. No, it's this, if you just tune back in or listen or, or slow it down, the experience is still here. You know, it's right in front of us the whole time, but we're kind of looking for it. That's the, that's the big joke. It's right here, but we look for it. And I was using the example the other day of that, um, the gorilla experiment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where you're told to watch the people throwing the ball to each other and you have to count <laughs> yeah, how many yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And afterwards they say, did you, what, did you spot the gorilla? Yeah. You think, gorilla? Oh, I've seen that, yeah. And then a guy that. walks on halfway through. <laughs> yeah, and you think, how did I miss that? Waves his arms <laughs> yeah. about. And, yeah. <laughs> Focus, yeah. perception, of, you know, what you're focusing on. That's right. Yeah. So we're missing everything else. Yeah. It's, it's deliberateness, isn't it, I suppose, a ritual. It's yeah. been very deliberate with what you're doing very attentive mm -hmm. um and yeah i think you know perhaps that's what the you know the eastern cultures do wonderfully with tea don't they they have the same mm -hmm. sort of thing where it's not about just making a cup of tea in a mug and you know putting in the milk and the sugar and then it's about the whole whole thing from start to finish um and i think that i've always been fascinated with other cultures like that you know the eastern culture and the way that they you know they just approach life in a very different way um, you know the Greek cultures. You know, we, me and Mike talk a lot about Greek philosophy and and the, the the ideas that they were coming up with back then, which were almost like it's like nuclear physics of the time. You know, uh, the the Parmenides, which was Socrates' teacher, believed that the whole world, the whole ex universe, didn't actually exist. It was just a projection that you projected onto your consciousness to occupy you through the mundanity of what this real existence was, which is nothing. So this is just like a show to keep us occupied. That's what Parmenides believed. <laughs> so just sticking with that for a second, because um, one of the questions that I asked you before we came in was um, something like, are we always hypnotized? Um, so, I mean, I'm interested in, in the answer, <laughs> but just to kind of um, tie it up with what you just said, in traditional, well, it's Buddhist and Hindu culture, what we're experiencing is what's called Maya, mm. which is a projection, a show. It's mm. an illusion. Yes, it's here, but it's just not substantial. It's not, it's not really here in that you can't grab hold of it. Um, and what we are is hypnotized by Maya. Okay. And as long as you're hypnotized by Maya, you're missing reality. It's like Plato's sun, you know, we're just watching the shadows. We That's have no idea saying. that the sun is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was about to say that it's in Plato's cave, uh, yeah. Plato's cave in it. And it's that allegory of it's just the, the fire behind us and the, the light projection by the fire. We just see the shadows, but we perceive the shadows as real. But if, we, if we'd never been out of the cave, we would never know any different, um, which which the first time I read that, it it just blew my mind to pieces when I read Plato's Allegory of the Cave. Um, but that's the same thing, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the, the word hyp, hyp, hypnotize or hypnosis, it comes from the Greek god Hypnos, you know, yeah. the Greek god of sleep. Um, and that's where we, we drew the name from um, in the 17th century. Before then, it wasn't known as hypnosis. You know, when Mesmer was doing it, it was mesmerism or magnetism, animal magnetism. It's had many different labels over many many different centuries going way back but it's all the same thing and it's it's we are constantly hypnotized you know there is no on and off switch it's just the the degree of how deep into hypnosis we go changes or the information mm. that's going on yeah so as we said earlier you can you can choose which which is the most useful stuff to be hypnotized by yes uh, and, and kind of let go of the stuff that's limiting God, that makes but, sense. But in a more ultimate sense, I mean, and I'm talking in more kind of you know uh, wisdom tradition sense. The you said hypnosis is the god of sleep, so they would suggest that we are all asleep yeah. to what we really are or to what really is, um, and what we're dreaming. Yeah. Dream is the another analogy that this is the kind of um, this is Maya, this is illusion, this is the projection, yeah. and we've forgotten what we are. Yeah. Um, because we're, we're just kind of, oh, I'm this body and I'm this mind and this world must be real. Mm -hmm. um, Graham Hancock talks about it, doesn't he? We're a species with amnesia yeah. and we've completely forgotten um, because of, for whatever reason, you know, uh, you, you could look at all of the ancient cultures from around the world. You know, the if you look at like South America um, specifically, those amazing South American cultures that get dated back centuries and centuries, if not thousands of years, but 
during the 15th and 16th century when the Spanish went and they basically burned everything. They just yeah. got rid of anything. The, the Alexandria books. Library, which yeah. was the Library of Antiquity, completely destroyed. Um, uh, I, I think I'm not... I'm going to say the Christians, but I might be wrong on that. But I think it was the Christians that, you know, that got rid of all that because of all the texts that were there. And what that's left us with is, as he would describe it, amnesia. You know, we, we've only got a certain amount of information that goes back a certain period of time to understand where we've come from. But but there's lots of evidence that would suggest that there's so much we don't know about us. And, yeah. and, and, and I think amnesia is a very good way of explaining that. If mm. you can control the past, you can control the future. You know, um, you know Graham Hancock's done that perfectly when he's looked into the ancient civilizations and looked to really built the pyramids and these ancient monuments and all the all the wisdom that they had back then you know um he also talks about the psychedelics experience and things like that which naturally through breathing we can release the the dimethyltryptamine or the dmt from the brain which is one of the most um powerful hallucinogenic uh psychedelics known to man you know this is what the shamans have used for centuries with ayahuasca and things like that and this stuff was used for healing this is stuff uh, that i think uh, stanislav groff uh, studied it and that's how yeah so he in actually the yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so he actually created, cross swords uh, <laughs> so he I'll actually the tone right down there I? <laughs> so he actually created the holotropic breath work which was obviously um he researched um lsd during um in in clinical trials when it was legal you know and then he noticed how people's bre- breathing would change and then he developed from that holotropic breath work now, what he was finding out through these psychedelic experiences is that he was having 10 years worth of psychotherapy in two sessions. You know, and, and these are things that we've been had taken away from us kind of thing. These are natural medicines and plants that have been used for centuries. Uh, you've got the Nicasia ne- ne- uh, Neurotica, I think it's called, that's on the on the walls of the pyramid that's inscribed, and that is a psychedelic plant. There's lots of stuff to do with the original text, I think the Gnostic text, to do with mushrooms and things like that. Um, which obviously also help with things in the right setting. You know, and you don't want to be going out with that type of stuff, with drinking alcohol and, and things like that. But there's so much there through nature and what nature can give us for, for healing. And we've kind of closed ourselves off from We're that. We're not right? allowed to go within. Yeah. It's not taught, it's not recommended. It, and, you know, that's the only that's the only path, that's the only yeah. direction that's going to make sense. It expands it's, consciousness. You know, yeah, expanding consciousness, creating more neurological pathways in the brain. Uh, I know a lot of people at uh, Silicon Valley and things are using things like microdosing, which mm. is helping. I know a guy, a friend of mine, uh, Ian Hart, who um, who was actually my roommate in in my um, Wim Hof method um, master module when we became instructors, and he was in the army and he uh, was uh, damaged by an injection and he had a real bad brain injury and he actually healed himself through microdosing of magic mushrooms because it creates new neurological pathways in the brain uh and and it's it's natural it's there and it, and it healed him and also he helped us i think he helped his father with that as well and uh, so yeah there's so much out what, there and there's so much we don't realize and what, one of the things i've always been fascinated with is um is these, these shamans that were all around the world thousands of years ago completely yeah. disconnected from a physical sense so they were in you know different parts of the world before we believe or perceive that we could travel to those areas yeah. but they're all they're all completely individually coming to the same conclusion with the the ayahuasca brews that are taken and i don't know enough about this to be you know i'm not going to yeah. sit in and say i know lots about it I, I don't but what what i was amazed by was the fact that they were doing all of these paintings all around the world that were all very very similar they're all you know really similar paintings um but they you know they were thousands of miles from each other but what's even more amazing, especially when you look at the Amazon, that you've got these probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of different plants, and they kind of arrive at this specific combination of, I think it's two, that come yeah. together that give this effect. Yeah. But then on the other side of the world, they've come, to get, they've come together at the same conclusion. with, And I find that just... I don't have any explanation for that. It blows my mind. You know, I can't. I can't explain it. Out of one hundred and twenty-five thousand different plant species in the Amazon, they found the one that has the inhibitor of the other. So basically, one has. We have. Uh, I think it's um, amine, uh, amino amine oxidase, which is in. Um, so we naturally have DMT already within us. So there's one plant that's high in that. The other one plant has a. Uh, 
a monoamine oxidase, and that basically Are you inhibits them words the, from someone? that, in, <laughs> that inhibits <laughs> that inhibits the, the 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 digestive system or the gut or the bowel to um, to inhibit that from happening. So which then means you can take the ayahuasca vine, and it has the psychedelic effect. Yeah. And the shamans found this out, and he said that basically the spirits of the jungle told them. Because they were connected, they were living in in the jungle. They were connected with the earth and Mother Earth or Gaia. And but we, we discount stuff like that, don't we? And, yeah. and that, that's that's what that's a consequence, I think, of our especially I think especially our Western culture, as opposed to Eastern. We we just discount that and we say that that can't be true. Um, um, I, 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 yeah. One of the things I would you know anyone listen to this, um, there are there's a three blocks, the three biggest blocks that's ever been carved by the by the at the hand of a human. Um, and, and it's at a place called Gebekli Tepe. It's called yeah. no, not Gebekli Tepe. Sorry, it's called the Trilithon. It's in Baalbek in Lebanon. You can yeah. Google it, and you can look at these three blocks, which are like, imagine putting two or three buses together and connecting them together, and they're unbelievably huge, almost out of this world huge. Yeah. And I, I show them on my course, as you'll see next week. I'll show pictures of it. You know, they're in this place, Lebanon. You can go and you can stand in front of them. These three huge Trilithon blocks. But I, I had um, a guy on one of my courses, which was incredible, who was actually uh, a world leading authority in crane lifting. Mm-hmm. And he looked at these blocks and said, we couldn't lift those today. Yeah. We couldn't do that today. We couldn't lift them with the cranes we have today. They are so big and so heavy, it would be impossible. But at some point in time, how they've done this, I don't know. And I'm not going to profuse to know the explanation we've moved them about 1.1 kilometers, raised them off the ground and placed them down so accurately, you know, you cannot get a credit card between the seam. And yeah. there is no explanation for that. There is no there is no book that you can open that would say, this is how we did it. But it has been done and it's right in front of our eyes. Yeah. And what we should do is wonder more. We should, instead of just saying that, that it couldn't have been done by that, or it couldn't have been done like that, they couldn't have come across the ayahuasca because the, the plant spoke to them. That's ridiculous. It makes yeah. no sense. We we discount like things like that. I think in our culture, and actually, the evidence is right in front of our eyes. It's yeah. there, and it happened. And instead of discounting it, we should pursue how. Like like we we believe we're like the height of creation already. Yeah, and we're, yeah. You know, whereas if we look back and we can go, <clears> well, okay. actually, the ancients knew, knew a lot more than than we do at the moment. They and you know, we, I think we need to go back to that. You know, and that's what I think. Somebody, somebody once showed me, now. and I don't know if it's the same thing that you're talking about, but they. They show me these these buildings that they might be in like Egypt and places like that, and they, they've been built like by hand, obviously. But I just don't know how. It's impossible how they've done it. Yeah, like a plasterer now could not plaster a wall like they like they've done it. Yeah. They, the brickwork and the detail in the brickwork, a, a bricky these days would have no idea how to do. It's it's like it's it's beautiful to look at but there's evidence that all over the world isn't yeah. there all That's over the world yeah. you know it's, it's right no. match picture you know look at the stones look like they've been melted and all yeah, carved exactly, into yeah. and, and slotted into place and it's like how have they done that how's that how they, yeah well, how hasn't that for me it's like how hasn't that moved with generations so how hasn't his son learned off his dad and how is his he not turned into a dad and then taught his son and how have we not moved with with I time. think those teachings have been lost over time. I think obviously the world has gone through many cycles and many changes. I think obviously you've got the flood and you've got other cataclysms and things that happen where we've kind of things have been wiped out from history. And I think um, blows I my think, mind. I think we're kind of rediscovering now, um, kind of on this journey of who we are and where we come from. And I think that's just with what's going on in the world and that right now is is it's time for change. And I think that's where we're kind of heading. In, you know. it, it, I, I've always had a thought that invention is the enemy of skill. Um, everything that we invent is to make something easier. We don't, we don't invent with the purpose of making it more, more time-consuming and more laborious to do a job. Every invention that you can think of has been invented to make a specific thing easier to do. And Jeff Bezos. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just mastered it with Amazon. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so I think as we evolve in one way with invention and technology we devolve in other ways and a great way to understand that is if you ask someone of sort of my era um we're we're similar sort of age i think i'm a little bit older me mike about the same age if you ask them what their phone number was from when they grew up they'll be able to reel off eight four two eight three seven they'll probably be able to reel off a couple of their friends numbers from their six digit combinations (laughs) but but young people now don't have that because they don't have a need for that because they don't have to remember it so we've evolved with technology 
obviously with the world around us and complexity, but we've also devolved in other ways. And, and memory is a good example, I think. I, I, I think I see that mostly in schools. Um, like, like you say, technology and everything has evolved, but it's evolved at such a rapid pace that these young minds just cannot go with it. Yeah. And, and they're, getting lo- they're getting lost in that. Look at penmanship. Mm. as an example so centuries ago the way people would write you know if they were fortunate enough to education was just incredible wasn't it mm. penmanship but if you look at like has we've evolved as a species and we don't need to have that skill so much you know my handwriting is absolutely terrible and it's shameful yeah. i i actually really love seeing someone with wonderful yeah, calligraphy yeah. and penmanship but as a as a collective generalization we've devolved that skill as a process that only happens when you when you write with a pen it doesn't happen when you're typing away on a screen yeah exactly yeah Um, Yeah. and and not only that i mean like this is the same with the body you know the the body has become weaker you know like by going into the cold you know what do we do uh you know like when we're born we're we're always in comfort we're always we're we're always wearing clothes uh we turn off the brown fat you know which is which is there from birth which keeps us warm generates heat which metabolizes white fat it's great for fat loss and things like that but we stop stimulating the body and what it needs to do you know especially the skin skin being the biggest organ of the body we're going into the cold we're training all these little veins arteries and capillaries to to contract and to open and to function properly and and the more we do that the more it it closes down quick and becomes stronger and and adapts and we become more resilient and we become uh you know we we can we can build that back up again whereas we've become like you said we said before weaker uh, with, with technologies and comfort and everything else so, so yeah. come full just, circle right at the end yeah, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. all the way back, all the way like, back. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't even know how to finish it yeah. uh, it's just literally blow my mind so. genuinely blow my mind and i thank you for letting letting us do this i think this yeah. has been brilliant and i think it'll come across so well and what i do want to say is obviously on the note that we've just finished on you know comfort and how the world's changing and how we need to build a little bit more resilience then please get in touch with these three people because mm. as you've just heard they've got oh, the knowledge is just incredible D- try the cold water do you know what i mean really do try it and, and come and see uh, ian mike meditation give it a go i do it i do it daily i do it with the kids in schools when they're panicking we'll do a 10 minute your your one on youtube mm. we do the 10 minute um body scan mm. We'll just sit and just do the ten minute body scan, and I think if people bring these little things into their lives, gratitude, things like that. Yeah. Feel Passion, that you can teach kindness. people so you know so much, and I can't wait to find out next week just how much I can learn. I'm an open book to it, and I'm I'm I can't wait to see what what I can be taught and how I can then help people with that. Um, but please, just contact these people if you're in a moment in your life when you know you, you don't really know what's happening. There could be so many different reasons for that and i think grounding yourself and you know giving yourself the best chance with doing natural things like this not searching for that tablet all the time you're giving yourself the best chance to to move forward in life i think you are your own guru your own healer your own you are my gurus yeah, right now yeah. well you are you your own healer. <laughs> you, know, you are your own guru you know that's so my cat my cat idea you, you know what i mean i'm so. gonna tell him this idea by the way about the three wise men, I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to, I, you know, it's a great idea and it's perfect. You are three very wise men. Christmas is coming up. We were going to hold it till Christmas, but I want to get this out because I, I think this. We're in a moment, aren't we, after this mm. big pandemic and people being away and stuff. Mm. I think things that they can really look at that are right in front of them that they can do in their everyday life yeah. that they're not doing right now that can that can really help. People are waking, yeah. People are waking up now. People are realizing, the, you know, what what they've been led to believe is is not what they've been led to believe, and that can be uh, quite destructive. So yeah. having things like this, so come and get in contact do, with these guys. Do you know? Do you know where the three wise men comes from? How long have you got? Because I've got about a minute. <laughs> it's, it's actually it's astrology, isn't it? So the three yeah. stars that dip down on December the twenty first, and they rise again a few days later, which is obviously the birth of Christ, and it. There is a lot of suggestion that comes from like like Gnostic Christians and and it, you know way before the time of Christ and it's to do with it just dips down for those few days in the depths of winter before it starts to rise again and then you get the rise of those. There you um, go, astronomy. We need if we don't stop now, we're not ever going to stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> the thing. <laughs> we can go. We could go all day. And I, do you know what? I've got so much energy. 
we'll like do it I've, again we'll do it yeah, again. We, will, yeah. we definitely need to do this again nice. but yeah um, thanks thank you the, yeah thanks for giving us the platform yeah, no well, seriously just talk openly and, and, I could, like yeah. I said I could do this all day every day and I think this people really need to look into stuff like this to to help them thanks for listening I hope I hope everyone got what I got from that because I'm full of energy right now <laughs> I just feel like my mind's being blown a bit um, so please do get in contact you're all on Facebook um, yeah Inner Alchemy. Inner Alchemy, yeah. Mike, you're on you? method platform. Mike Cooley, mindfulness teacher on Facebook. Uh, well, Peaky Performance, obviously, and myself, yeah. Phil Quirk, and then Maya Goji as well as uh, my my new venture. So look into them. Just just give them a follow, and, and you'll definitely learn something new from them. I can guarantee that. Uh, thanks for listening, and if you need us, you can get us on Facebook as well at Reach IOM.